Thanks to MPB for sponsoring this video. Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is part one of my review of the Sony Alpha 9 III, a supremely quick 24 megapixel full frame camera with a global shutter that allows 120 frames per second bursts, flash sync up to 80 thousandth of a second, and electronic photos and videos that are free from distortion. Announced in November 23 at a price of around $6,000 or pounds, it's an unashamedly specialist camera, primarily aimed at pro sports and action photographers, although it could also tempt videographers or silent shooters who wish to banish the skewing effect of rolling shutter or banding from artificial lights. In this video, I'll show you everything that I know so far based on spending some time with a pre-production A93 at a Sony press event, as well as interviewing various Sony engineers about the new technologies. Now, I'm personally wary of anything that's described as a game changer, so decided to delay this video a bit to let the hype settle down, absorb my results so far, and calmly present the pros and cons. There's loads to talk about here, and once I've tested a final production model for part two, I'll also link to it. Now, if you're thinking of buying a new camera, chances are that you already have an older one which you could sell to raise some funds to put towards it. I use MPB to sell my photo gear because there's no messing about with multiple buyers or arranging deliveries or paying fees after you've made the sale. Just go to their website at mpb.com for an instant quote, which includes free collection from your doorstep. For example, at the time I made this video, MPB offered me £1,100 on a used Sony A9 Mark I or £1,550 on a used Mark II version. I'm quoting pounds here because I'm based in the UK, but MPB also operates across Europe and the US. Remember, these prices already include postage from your doorstep and all of the fees, so there's no nasty surprises, extra payments to make, or anyone else to deal with. And once they collect your gear and confirm its condition, you can choose to accept the quote and receive the money in your account the next day. Ultimately, MPB makes buying and selling used photo gear as simple as possible. So if you have anything that you don't need anymore, head over to mpb.com or use the link in the description for an instant quote. Right, back to my review. The key behind the A93's capabilities is having a sensor with a global shutter, which can read the entire image in one go, rather than line by line on traditional sensors. Sure, the stacked sensors on models like the Nikon Z9, Canon R3, and Sony's previous A9s and A1 may all be very quick, but their electronic shutters still read sequentially, line by line, and can still suffer from skewing and banding artifacts. In contrast, the A93's global shutter eliminates skewing on video or electronic stills, as well as allowing bursts up to 120 frames per second with autofocus at the full 24 megapixel resolution and even in 14-bit RAW. The A93's global shutter should also mean that there's no more banding from artificial lights and the ability to synchronize a flash at any shutter speed, even up to the camera's maximum speed of 80 thousandth of a second. Indeed, it's the capabilities of a global shutter that's allowed Sony to dispense with a mechanical shutter altogether and deliver an entirely electronic camera. And remember, while the Nikon Z8 and Z9 are also fully electronic bodies, they don't have a global shutter. Again, their stack sensor may be very quick, but it's not as fast as this new Sony. Now, global shutters aren't a new thing. They've been around for ages, most commonly on early CCD sensors, and today typically deployed for industrial or specialist applications. But the A93 becomes the first camera to sport a full-frame CMOS sensor with global shutter. So it's large, it's CMOS, and in a camera body that's designed for photography rather than scanning barcodes. It's a big coup for Sony in the run-up to the Olympics in 2024, which is presumably why the announcement was made eight months earlier, long before its planned on sale date of spring 24. Clearly, Sony wants to get well ahead of whatever Canon and Nikon may have planned. But like any product launched with the Olympics in mind, the A93 is a very specialist camera, again costing six grand and aimed at those who absolutely demand the fastest bursts or the least distortion. And while it does provide some unique possibilities under artificial lighting, the A93 is simply not going to be Sony's best camera for traditional portrait or landscape photographers, nor for that matter mainstream videographers either. Now it could give these people some benefits under specific conditions, but don't assume it's automatically going to be your best choice. That said, like all new technologies, it's exciting to see just what it can do and what might trickle down to more mainstream models in the future. So with the scene fully set, let's get into my results made with a pre-production camera. 
Let's start with the body, which at first glance looks a lot like recent Alpha models. But in your hands, you'll notice the improved grip and repositioned shutter release do make it feel much more comfortable. And while Sony continues to resist building a pro body with a built-in portrait grip, there's still plenty to hold on to here, and a new optional grip if you yearn for more. On the upper left side, there's the familiar two-tiered dial with focus modes at the bottom and drive modes on the top, both with locks which need to be pushed to turn. Note the asterisk icon on the drive dial, which transfers drive mode control to the screen menus instead if preferred. On the upper right side is a straightforward exposure mode dial, atop a simpler collar that switches between stills, movies, and the S and Q shooting modes, again both with push locks. There's also two customizable thumb dials, the left one turning freely, like the front finger dial, and the other one lockable, but this time with a ballpoint style button. Now, I'd have preferred Sony to lock all the dials using the same type of button, as it feels a bit inconsistent to have two different styles. What do you think? While we're looking at the top right surface, notice the C1 and C2 function buttons, now larger and more pronounced than before, as well as the angled shutter release. From the front, note the new C5 function button by the lens mount. This is customizable, but by default activates the speed boost option that can temporarily accelerate the burst while pushed. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Meanwhile, around the back, it's pretty much business as usual with familiar controls, including a movie record button by the viewfinder, an AF on button, joystick, and tiltable rear thumb wheel. Moving on to the viewfinder, the A9 III inherits the 9.44 million dot OLED panel of the A7R5 and Alpha 1 with its huge 0.9 times magnification, and you're watching a recording that I made through it. This delivers a large, very detailed, and pretty immersive view, and now impressively supports a smooth 120 frames per second refresh with the display quality set to high. Compare that to the A7R5, which reduced its quality when set to 120 frames per second. If the viewfinder image is too large, maybe if you can't bring your eye right up to it, you can reduce the size in the menus. There's also the chance to double the finder frame rate to 240 frames per second like the Alpha 1, albeit with a reduction in the image size. I never felt the need to do this myself though. Note many electronic viewfinders reduce their detail while the camera is continuously auto-focusing. Now I didn't notice this during my time with the A93 so far, but I will formally test it on a final sample. Moving on to the screen, the A93 inherits the 3.2 inch 2095 k dot panel of the A7R5 with its cunning four axis articulation. This has a side hinge mechanism that allows the screen to flip out and twist around to face you or back on itself for protection. But what makes it really clever is this mechanism is mounted on top of a simpler one that pulls out and vertically tilts for a quicker adjustment that remains in line with the optical axis and tripod thread. This dual approach, first seen on the Panasonic Lumix S1H, successfully solves the problem of which type of articulation a camera screen should employ. And while it's inevitably thicker than more basic options, Sony has managed to accommodate it in the body here. Moving on to card slots, it's not surprising to find the A9 III inheriting the twin dual format card slots of recent higher-end alpha bodies, with each slot able to accommodate either SD or faster CF Express Type A cards. The good news is the A9 III can shoot video or stills at its top frame rates with SD cards, but the buffer will be slower to empty than when using CF Express. So if you do intend to exploit the faster bursts of the A9 III and don't want to be kept hanging around, you will need to budget for CF Express cards. Would I have preferred Sony to use the more affordable and faster CF Express Type B cards? Of course I would, but a pair of them would have made the camera larger and probably ruled out the chance to alternatively use dual SD cards. Ultimately, Sony's made its choice though, so again, to make the most of the A9 III, you will need to invest in Type A CF Express cards. In terms of ports, the A93 is equipped with 3.5mm microphone and headphone jacks, as well as both USB-C 3.2 and micro USB ports, allowing simultaneous power and tethering. There's also a PC sync port for external lighting, a full-size HDMI port, take that Canon, and a gigabit Ethernet port as an alternative to USB for tethered shooting or file transfer. For power, the A93 employs the trusty FZ100 pack, with Sony initially quoting around 500 shots in the specs, but this will hugely vary depending on your usage. For example, I shot over 2,500 images in various fast bursts, along with some 4K 120 video clips, on a single battery charge, with a little bit remaining at the end. 
If you want more power, a new vertical grip accessory will take a pair of FZ100 packs and treat them as one power source, as well as providing portrait controls, including a duplicate C5 button on the front. Okay, now onto the headline feature of the A93, which as you all know by now, is having the first full frame CMOS sensor with a global shutter. As you'll see, this allows the camera to dispense with a mechanical shutter altogether for image capture, although this in turn means it needs alternative protection from dust. Sony's got you covered though, and in setup menu 13, you'll find an anti-dust section with the option to deploy a curtain at power off. And here's how it looks in action, closing four seconds after I switch the power off. And looking to me a lot like a mechanical shutter curtain. What do you think? Maybe they just left it in there and now only use it for optional dust protection. But be in no doubt, there is no mechanical shutter option for shooting images in the menus, nor any kind of electronic first curtain either. This is a 100% electronic shutter only, which means it's also noise and vibration free. While this makes the A93 perfect for quiet or silent environments, I did miss the physical feedback of a mechanical shutter at other times. Maybe a future model could have haptic options like a smartphone. There's built-in sensor shift stabilization or IBIS for short with up to eight stops of compensation depending on the lens and the conditions. So I presume it's inherited from the A7R5. It also has the latest dynamic active movie IS mode and I'm gonna examine both in detail in my final review. So now let's look at the image quality options which let you choose between JPEG or HIF for compressed images with no less than five options for RAW including three lossless modes. The maximum resolution is 24 megapixels with images measuring 6,000 by 4,000 pixels while lower 10 and six megapixel options are also available. While the A93 is obviously not huge on resolution, Sony argues 24 megapixels is fine for the intended use, especially when dealing with bursts up to 120 frames per second. I mean, think of all the data. But I also believe the global shutter played a role in choosing the maximum resolution. Now, as I personally understand it, there's additional circuitry required for a global shutter. And while Sony's stack design has maximized the potential light gathering area, is still not going to be as efficient as a traditional sensor. So the resolution was kept at a sensible 24 megapixels. Another clue to potentially reduce light gathering though is the base sensitivity of 250 ISO or 2000 for S-Log3. Coupled with the fact that this was the first Sony launch I can remember where they haven't proudly quoted the dynamic range in the presentation. Plus there's nothing to convert the raw files yet anyway so we can only evaluate JPEGs right now. So dynamic range is unknown at the moment. To be fair, the camera isn't even finished yet, so the image quality could change. But my guess right now is that the A93 will not match the dynamic range of the best models out there. But equally, it's not supposed to. This is a camera that's designed for fast bursts or high frame rate video, mostly at high ISOs. So let's have a look at some examples, starting with a daylight shot taken with the FE 24-70 2.8 GM2 lens at f8 and at the base sensitivity of 250 ISO. Like other cameras, there are extended ISOs which start lower, but they generally compromise dynamic range. So 250 is where you'll enjoy the best quality. And looking closely at this image, there's plenty of detail and nothing bad to report, as in Digit Hope. And for fun, here's another shot at 250 ISO, but this time with the new FE 300mm 2.8 telephoto launched alongside the camera, with the aperture wide open to 2.8. Obviously now the depth of field is gonna be much shallower, but the focused areas are very crisp and detailed. This lens and camera are gonna make a great combination for sports and action. Of course, it's easy to look good at the base sensitivity though, so let's check out some higher ISO shots taken at night, again with the 24 to 70, although this time at F4 and starting at 3200 ISO. Taking a closer look shows the image is pretty clean at 3200 ISO. And remember, these are all out of camera JPEGs from a pre-production camera. At 6400 ISO, there's a visible increase in noise, but it's still not too bad here. And again, at 12,800, the image still contains lots of details and could respond well to noise reduction. At the top two sensitivities of 25,600 and 51,200 ISO though, the noise levels have become pretty high and are having a detrimental impact on the detail. When shooting sports at the admittedly very well lit press event, I was generally working between 3200 and 12,800 ISO, where, as you'll see in a moment, the quality looked pretty good. The chance to shoot bursts up to 120 frames per second also opens interesting opportunities for composite captures, and the A93 introduces a new raw composite mode. You can set this to capture four, 
8, 16 or 32 images in a quick handheld burst. And remember at 120 frames per second, it's only going to take a quarter of a second to grab 32 images. These are then combined later in Sony's Imaging Edge software on a PC or Mac to generate a new RAW or JPEG file with lower noise. It's a shame the camera doesn't have sufficient resources to do this internally, especially as Sony had an internal multi-frame NR option for JPEGs a while back, but I do look forward to testing it when the software is available. It also opens some intriguing possibilities in the future for combining multiple images in a similar way to a modern phone. Let's see what happens. Before moving on to autofocus and bursts, I wanted to do some rolling shutter tests. Historically, one of the big issues facing an electronic shutter, but one that should be avoided with a truly global shutter. Let's start with a fast handheld pan made from left to right at 70mm with the camera set to 30 frames per second. I'm showing you 30 images here, so the actual period from left to right was just one second. As you can see, the A93 impressively avoids skewing altogether here. It's not that it's reduced a bit, as with previous fast sensors, it has completely gone. I then headed to the New York subway to see how it handled passing trains. A real torture test for rolling shutter, but again the verticals are completely upright here, proving that skewing just isn't going to be an issue with this technology, and this alone could sell it to you. Although do remember, if you're happy with a slower and noisier mechanical shutter, that old technology also avoids skewing and banding. The global shutter is only going to be a benefit if you're shooting electronically. And that's why it's so valuable for video, because it's electronic only. And I'll show you some examples in just a moment. Okay, now for those fast shutter speeds, with the A93 boasting a top shutter of 80 thousandth of a second. That's seriously fast, especially compared to rival systems, which typically have fastest electronic shutters of 8 thousandth to 32 thousandth. Terms and conditions apply though, with the maximum speed reducing to 16 thousandth of a second at apertures brighter than f1.8, and that means that you won't be able to exploit those faster shutter speeds when trying to shoot larger aperture lenses in very bright conditions. For example, at 100 ISO, a shutter speed of 16 thousandth should let you shoot at f1.4 or maybe 1.2 in bright daylight. But remember on the A93, 100 ISO is an extended sensitivity. If you want the best quality at this camera's base sensitivity, you'll be shooting at 250 ISO and sadly needing to use an ND filter for very bright apertures under these bright daylight conditions. It's also worth noting that a base of 250 ISO isn't going to be ideal for long exposure daytime photography either, again demanding greater filtration. As I said at the start, a global shutter is not going to be the solution for everybody, it is a specialist tool. But in good news, the A93's global shutter really does provide some fascinating options for flash photography, whether on or off camera. While most modern cameras have a maximum flash sync speed of say around 200th of a second and demand compromised workarounds for anything faster, the A93 really will sync up to its top shutter speed of 80,000th of a second. And this in turn lets you shoot in bright outdoor conditions, letting the flash take care of the nearby subject and allowing the background exposure to be completely controlled by the shutter alone. To demonstrate what's possible, here's a sequence I took with the A93 fitted with the HVL F60 RM2, a standard flash gun costing around 500 bucks. Now the aperture and ISO are fixed at f2.8 and 250 ISO, while the shutter is the only variable. As I gradually double the shutter speed, halving the background exposure each time, you can see how the background becomes progressively darker, while the flash and TTL metering maintains the correct subject exposure. A 4,000th of a second, what started as broad sunny daylight, is now beginning to look a bit like dusk, while at 16,000th onwards it looks like I shot the scene at night. But check the timestamp, just before 3pm in New York in November on a very sunny afternoon. Here's another sequence showing the same effect of gradually turning daylight conditions into night by simply using faster shutter speeds, and also proving how the flash will still sync right up to 80,000th of a second. And for a really extreme example, this is shot directly towards the sun, where at typical flash sync speeds the background would be completely washed out, at least at larger apertures, but here it's perfectly controlled, even at f2.8. Genuinely high speed flash syncs are possible on some other systems, typically employing leaf shutters, but this is the first time that we've seen it on a camera in this category, and it does provide the A93 with some unique creative possibilities, at least in its peer group. I believe the Sony F60 and F46 flash guns should also support 20 frames per second burst shooting. 
And if you are using external lighting, you can also adjust the camera's sync pulse to ensure that the shutter matches the moment of maximum flash power. After all, at these kind of shutter speeds, the camera can actually be faster than many flashes and could even curtail their effective output. Here's another example of a fast flash sync with the A93 fitted with the F60 flash and the shutter set manually to 26 thousandths per second. Here the camera metered a sensitivity of 6400 ISO at f2.8. I didn't need a shutter speed quite this fast to freeze this particular action, but it does again demonstrate a fast flash sync speed. The fast sensor brings us onto the A93's next headline feature, burst shooting up to 120 frames per second. And unlike the fastest modes on rival models, the A93 can do so at its full 24 megapixel resolution with autofocus and even in 14 bit RAW if you like. But the first question you should ask yourself is, what kind of action even needs bursts that fast? Well, here's some that I took with the A93 at the full 120 frames per second, where you can genuinely see more difference between the frames than you might expect, and more chance therefore to capture the decisive moment you desire. Yes, it is very, very fast, but there are uses for it, and of course the chance to reduce the burst to more common speeds if preferred. There are of course some restrictions. At the time I tested the A93, the fastest shutter was limited to 16 thousandths per second for burst shooting, leaving the fastest shutter speeds for single shot modes, at least for now. The fastest bursts also demand a lens that can keep up and Sony's provided a compatibility list on a support page, which you can see here and I'll link to in the description. Probably the biggest restriction though is simply handling that amount of data. The A93 may sport a generous buffer of up to 192 shots, but at 120 frames per second, you're gonna burn through that in about a second and a half before the camera slows down or stalls as it rides to the card. And that's why you should definitely budget for a CF Express card, which can clear the buffer faster than SD. There's also the question of how do you even easily navigate through that many images in playback? Well, Sony's thought about the practicality of both shooting and viewing images in 120 frames per second bursts with a couple of pretty considerate features. Realizing 120 frames per second is only really justified for the briefest moments of action, the A93 offers a speed boost option that allows you to shoot at a lower speed as you hold the shutter down, but temporarily increase the speed as you push a second button. By default, this function is assigned to the new C5 button on the front, and you could configure the camera to say shoot at 30 frames per second for normal bursts, and only increase it to 120 or even just 60 as you push this extra button. In practice, it took a few moments for me to get used to holding the shutter button with my index finger, then using my middle finger to tap the C5 like a shift key for that speed boost. But before long, I got the hang of it and it really does extend the usable buffer depth. Note, there are some caveats where the burst could be briefly interrupted when switching from one specific speed to another, so further testing will be needed here. There's also the bigger question that will be posed by fans of Knight Rider who will ask why it wasn't called Turbo Boost. To further ensure you won't miss the perfect moment, the A93 finally debuts a pre-capture mode on the Sony camera. This maintains a rolling buffer of frames as you half press the shutter before then committing them to memory with a full push. The A93 lets you choose the period that's buffered from one second to 0.005 seconds with several increments in between. Typically you keep the shutter half pressed as you wait in anticipation, then only fully push down the moment, say, a player makes contact with the ball or a bird takes flight, safe in the knowledge that you'll then have a few frames preceding that moment in case your reactions aren't quite quick enough. Obviously, these pre-capture frames will come out of your total buffer budget, so it is wise to select the shortest pre-capture period necessary so you've got room for enough frames both before and after that full push. It's a genuinely useful feature, albeit one that's been available for years on other systems, most notably Micro Four Thirds models from Panasonic and Olympus or OM systems. And they are long overdue on a flagship sports body from a technology leader like Sony, but at least we have it now. Okay, so how do you navigate such large bursts, not to mention the pre-capture aspects? Here's some bursts that I took at 120 frames per second using the new 300mm 2.8 lens, and the A93's pre-capture mode with a half second buffer. In playback, bursts are presented in groups, such as these containing 75 images, 57 images, 66 images, or 126 images. And this is the group that I want to examine more closely here. After clicking the rear wheel to expand this particular group, there's three things that I want you to notice on the screen. 
First is the timestamp at the bottom, here showing 1 minute and 44 seconds past 2. So this is going to confirm the speed at which I shot the burst. Second is the icon of an arrow towards the upper left side, which indicates that this was a burst taken with the pre-capture mode. And you'll notice this icon change when I reach the frame at which I actually push the shutter all the way down. So keep an eye on this and the actual frame counter showing where you are in the burst. And finally, the playback mode will also indicate the AF area that the camera selected, showing how well the AF system recognized and tracked this subject using human face and eye detection. So the first thing you can do is push the rear wheel downwards to play the images in a sequence, like a video clip. This will show you straight away the period of capture from beginning to end and whether it actually contains the moment that you're after. For example, if it misses the point of contact, you can just dispense with that group altogether. Or, of course, with the group expanded, you can simply go through the images one at a time. And as I do this here, you can see how even at 120 frames per second, there's actually notable differences between each frame. Also notice the timestamp, still on the 44th second, and that I'm also still within the pre-capture period. In fact, it's not until frame 43 in this group that the second counter is increased by one. As I progress through the sequence, you'll notice the pre-capture icon disappears at frame 61. So this is the point at which I actually push the shutter button all the way down. All of the frames prior to this point, 60 in total, were part of my pre-capture burst, half a second's worth at 120 frames per second. But in this particular example, I was actually quick enough to push the button just before the moment of contact at around frame 67 and 68. As I keep going through the sequence, notice not just the motion between each frame, but also how the AF system stays with a subject's face even when their arm is blocking half of it. The A93 unsurprisingly employs Sony's latest AI processing unit for subject recognition, which made its debut on the A7R5. And while it is being deployed across various Sony cameras in the range, it really shines on one this fast, easily locking onto most humans, animals, birds and vehicles, even in tricky poses. Like previous models with similar technology, you still have to manually choose the main subject type. And while there is a combined animal and bird option, I do wish that Sony could implement completely automatic subject detection as seen on recent models from Canon and Fujifilm. To be fair, I don't think it's a big issue for the A93 as typical users will probably only be photographing one type of subject at a time. But for future more mainstream models, I would like to see it as an option. And while it lacks the glamour of the global shutter, one of my personal favourite new features on the A93 is the simple addition of extra small and large AF boxes for single area modes. Now there's been plenty of times on earlier Sony cameras where I yearned for a more precise tiny AF box to manually position on the frame, or conversely a larger one working like a more focused zone area. Well, now we have them. Next, I wanted to demonstrate some video features, and even if this isn't your primary interest, do stick around as some of them really do illustrate the benefit of global shutters. And while I chat, here's some video menus when the camera's set to NTSC. The A93 inherits most of the video options of recent alpha bodies, so you're getting 1080 or 4K video in a choice of codecs, bit rates, and frame rates. The maximum frame rate for standard video with sound and autofocus is 120p in either 1080 or 4K. Although if you switch to the S and Q mode, it is possible to access 1080 at 240p for a potential 10 times slowdown when encoded at 24p. All video is uncropped, including 4K 120, although oversampling is only implemented up to 60p in 4K. Like most alphas, there's no wider DCI option, no open gay or higher video resolutions like 6K for cropping in post, and no internal recording of ProRes or RAW either. You can output 16-bit raw video over HDMI to an external recorder though. Okay, let's have a look at the quality, starting with a clip I filmed in 1080 at 24p using the 24-70 2.8 GM2 lens. Now for the A93 in 1080 at 60p, before switching to 1080 at 120p. All of these play back at normal speed, but can of course be slowed on your timeline. Next, here's the S and Q mode capturing 1080 at 240p, but encoded at 24p for playback at 10 times slower speed than normal. Now let's briefly return to 1080 24p before switching to 4K at 24p, where you'll see a boost in fine detail. And now for 4K at 60p, where the A93 is still oversampling from around 6K's worth of data. And finally, 4K at 120p, where it may no longer have the resources to oversample, but at least the field of view is uncropped. I'll make more detailed resolution and dynamic range comparisons in my final review. 
How about high sensitivity? Here's a quick clip that I filmed with the A93 in 4K 24p at 12,800 ISO with the lens at 24mm. This is handheld using IBIS alone, although I was fairly well braced against a ledge. Again, I'll do more detailed comparisons about video quality with a final sample, but I can show you the impact of global shutter on skewing and slow motion. So hold on to your stomachs as I vigorously shake the A93 from side to side in a series of 4K clips, first at 24p, where if you can bear to watch, you'll see no evidence of skewing. And now in 4K 60p, where even with the continued overhead of oversampling, there's no skewing from rolling shutter that's visible. And for good measure, at 4K 120p, where the camera may no longer be oversampling, but it's still dealing with a lot of data. And again, no pesky slanted verticals to worry about. This absence of skewing is equally evident when filming a fast moving subject, like a subway train accelerating from the platform, here filmed in 4K 24p. Now you may notice some of the LED displays on the train showing the destination are a bit slanted, but that's due to how they're refreshed. The actual real life train here is showing nice natural vertical lines without the skewing of cameras with slower sensors. If you or your client is particularly sensitive to skewing on video or have a project where it's undesirable, the A93 can now avoid it, which could be all you need to know. Yes, it is expensive just to have that one capability, but it is cheaper than many dedicated fast cinema cameras. Let's check out some slow motion now, all filmed in 4K 120p and slowed by five times here on my 24p timeline. The longest shots of table tennis were filmed using the new 302.8 handheld while the closer positions were filmed with the 2470 GM2, again handheld. As for overheating, I'll leave that to my review of a final sample. And as I wrap up this review, I'd love to hear what else you'd like to know more about for my follow-up. So now for my verdict so far. The A93 becomes Sony's fastest full-frame camera for sports and action photography, shooting 24 megapixel photos up to 120 frames per second with an optional pre-capture buffer, blackout-free viewfinder, uncropped 4K 120 video and their best autofocus system to date. Behind the scenes is Sony's first full-frame CMOS sensor with a global shutter, which not only makes these speeds possible, but also eliminates the rolling shutter of conventional sensors, which can cause undesirable skewing on video or electronic photos, as well as eliminating banding under artificial light. The global shutter also lets you synchronize flashes at speeds way beyond rival cameras, all the way up to 80 thousandths of a second, in turn giving you the creative possibilities of transforming bright sunlight into the appearance of dusk or even night, just with the shutter speed alone. Beyond the usual caveats with certain combinations of lenses or settings, the A93 really does perform as advertised, but be in no doubt that this is a highly specialist camera which excels at very specific tasks and will only be a game changer for those who play very particular games. If you want more detailed images from a Sony camera, go for the A7R5. If you want a Sony that's aimed at video first, get the A7S III or an FX3. If you like the idea of a fast Sony camera for sports but can't stretch the A93, just get the older A92 or even the original A9. They're both plenty fast enough for most of us. And if you want a Sony camera that still pretty much does everything, how about the A1, albeit in the knowledge that it is due for a successor at some point. Ultimately, you should only consider the A93 if you absolutely need the benefits of its global shutter. For example, if you need 120 frames per second, or need to avoid skewing on video or electronic photos, or need to avoid banding under artificial light, or need to synchronize flashes at fast shutter speeds. And crucially, if you're happy to pay six grand for any of those privileges. It's also important to remember that while the A93's global shutter hugely improves electronic capture, you can achieve or approach some of its benefits with older or alternative technologies. For example, camera systems with leaf shutters have been synchronizing high-speed flashes for years, while good old mechanical shutters have avoided skewing and banding on photos since day one. Sure, they're not doing it anywhere near as fast as the A93, nor for silent shutters or pre-burst captures or for video, but when you're spending this amount of money, it is critical to look beyond the hype and think very carefully about which features you actually need and which technologies will deliver the experience and results that you want. Personally speaking, when using the A93, I was most struck by the absence of rolling shutter on video, and I immediately hoped that it would filter down to mainstream cameras sooner rather than later. I mean, I'd like that technology for my family and holiday videos, but I think it could be a long time, at least for cameras with larger sensors. 
The A93's global shutter literally builds upon existing stack technology that even years after the first A9 is still too expensive for mainstream cameras. I think it may turn up on smaller sensors in phones or dedicated vlogging and action cameras in the future, but if you want it on full frame, you're gonna to need to dig deep, and I suspect only find it from Sony, at least for some time to come. One thing's for certain though, in the highly niche world of professionals who photograph the Olympics and other elite sporting events, the A93 is a truly impressive camera, which throws down the gauntlet to Canon and Nikon. Now let's see how they respond. And that's as much as I can say for part one of this review. I hope to follow up with a second part once the camera is in final production, at which point I can answer more of your questions and dive deeper into the performance and quality. But until then, I'd love to hear what you think so far in the comments, and a big thanks if you made it all the way through this longer than anticipated video. Thanks also to MPB for sponsoring this video. If you have any photo gear to buy, sell or trade, check them out at mpb.com or using the links in the description. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.